Good evening, everyone. My name is Jessica Weaver, and on behalf of the Future Forum, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight for the, our discussion on gun control and school safety. The Future Forum is an organization that brings together individuals with different backgrounds, experiences, and points of view to discuss the most important issues that affect us all. Our goal is to create civil, informed, and bipartisan discourse, which is perhaps needed now more than ever. The Future Forum's events are made possible by our incredible members and sponsors. If you are not already a member of the forum, I strongly encourage you to sign up before you leave tonight, or at the very least, visit lbjfutureforum.org to learn more. We are lucky to be joined tonight by two law enforcement experts to their, on their approaches to keeping students safe. This discussion will not be an easy one, but it is critically important in today's society. Please keep in mind that there will be time for questions at the end of the panel, and I hope you'll all join us after to continue the conversation and enjoy the reception. And we'll also be live streaming tonight's debate between Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke after the reception. And now I'll turn it over to R.G. Ratcliffe, Senior Editor at Texas Monthly, to introduce our guests and moderate our discussion. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, first off, we were also going to have um, uh, Chris Avoy, who is the Assistant Chief of the Austin Independent School District, but uh, with the flooding and everything, uh, he wasn't able to make it tonight. Uh, so anyway, we have to my left, David Carter. He's the uh, Chief of Police for the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he believes very strongly in community policing and intelligence to lead police strategies created a bike unit. He has a Bachelor of Science from Texas A&M University and... Um, All together. <laughs> <laughs> President got over it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I went to the University of Missouri, so I can't hold it against him. Um, and uh, anyway, the uh, and uh, has taken the FBI's premier executive training course. To his left is Brian Manley, the... Uh, uh, interim Chief of Police with the Austin Police Department. He's been with the department since 1990. Uh, he interim. Interim. He dropped that. No, no. Oh, we dropped that. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> we're Chief of Police. Um, the, uh, and uh, let's see what we got here. I'll tell you what, I'll just let, since, since I've already hit an error here, I'll let him explain himself. Um, <laughs> but... I'm gonna open this discussion. We're supposed to be talking tonight primarily about uh, gun safety and school safety. So I'm gonna open this up with, uh, this will obviously be an issue in the upcoming legislative session, primarily because of the Santa Fe High School shooting. And Governor Abbott has laid out some things that he wants to have done. So I'm just gonna open this up with, the legislature has decided to give uh, or spend $500 million on school safety across the state. What would you do with that money if you had the opportunity? We'll go this way. So, so first off, uh, uh, thanks, RG, and thanks everybody for having me. I did want to clarify, President Powers is the one that actually hired me, and we went through a little process at the, uh, at the end of the national search. I was actually at APD, retired there, second in command under Acevedo at that time. And, but I went to President Power's office. I go in there after going through all the committees and all, so forth. He's got his feet up on the desk and he's, still, he's kind of staring at me and says, we've got a problem. And so I said, yes, I know, it's my alma mater. But anyway, so we developed a good relationship and we got through that process. <laughs> Thanks everybody for being here. So the, I think the question really is, is about $500 million that, that uh, would be slotted for school safety. I think one of the things that's really important to recognize here is the the, um, the, the primary recipient of that is, is obviously will be school districts like Austin Independent School District. So what we're talking about, the governor's office is talking about those kinds of issues primarily. Universities are obviously uh, something of a, a concern as any large venue. I mean, universities have been subject to active shooters and other kinds of issues here. The Texas legislature, who I work for, uh, I answer to the president, but I also answer to the system and as well as to the legislature. So I, I basically want you to understand that. It's one of the uh, things that I have to do is to kind of look at those kinds of things here. The money here, so it's in a, in a perfect world, that money is going to address uh, school safety. When we say, talk about school safety, I'm, I'm, th I'm assuming K through 12 as opposed to the University of Texas or Texas A&M or Texas Tech or something like that. 
uh, for the most part. Uh, we have to look at the issues that are, uh, are facing us, how to best spend that $500 million uh, if that comes to pass is, is really important and really the answer for that comes to, to, to y'all. I want to talk more about how we at the University of Texas and UTPD operate to have a safe college community. I want to kind of just take a couple of moments to uh, describe the University of Texas and how it is different than a high school setting. Because my daytime population here at UT Austin is about 80,000. If you think about it in terms of 51,000 students, another 20, 24,000 faculty and staff, and on, on any given day, five to 10,000 visitors during the week. And on certain Saturdays, depending how well the team's doing, and they're doing very well right now, can be uh, on campus up to 120,000 with at least 100,000 of them sitting inside the stadium. So really, we're a medium-sized city. And so we police UT Austin like a medium-sized city. We're not a medium-sized Texas city. It's not a small town. It's pretty complex. We've got 164 buildings scattered across the, the so-called 40 acres, which were much larger than that. We have research facilities up north and other facilities throughout the city and across the state that UTPD is responsible for. So we're talking about something a little bit different. Right now, I think we're talking specifically K through 12. Where does $500 million go? Well, there's a lot of things that are tossed out there. Your input is really important there. My input, and I'm going to let uh, Chief Manley address his, mine is really is working with you. <coughs> and our stakeholders. That's what we, we talked about at first, the community policing concept. What I'm thinking about the issue is I'm not thinking about the hardware and the physical security of a building uh, or a uh, high school building or an elementary school building. That's really important. There's a lot of stuff on hardening targets. But where I'm coming from is a medium-sized city of dynamic young people, for the most part, that are here at UT Austin. How do I keep them safe? One of the best ways we keep our community safe is really engaging with them. One of the things that we have to think about in terms of gun safety is we also have to know what our issues are. So I, I came to, uh, retired from the Austin Police Department in, in the summer of 2013 to become the, the uh, Chief of Police here at UT. And then this past year, Assistant Vice President over Campus Security, as well as the Chief. But one of the things that we, we really looked at is that the fact that when I got here, there was not a campus carry kinds of issues. That, so the legislature comes in and works on and passes various laws based on your support for those positions or debate about those kind of positions. My job is to kind of uh, execute whatever the law is. That's the same for all police. One of the things that we, we want to talk about here today is that what is the police responsibility versus the citizen's responsibility. Uh, I, I feel strongly in that community engagement, working with you. You pass the laws. So I don't have a specific answer for you. Obviously, you want to, they want to harden those facilities in terms of doors, and I guess they're thinking of metal detectors and things like that. They're thinking of other things as well. To me, the most important thing to here really is to stay engaged with that process Work with your police to address areas of concern. And I'm happy to kind of okay. talk about how that. We'll, we'll come back you know, to that, yeah. Chief Manley. Well, thank you all for coming out. And uh, just probably the only introduction I need is to let you know that I am a UT alum. I did do my undergraduate work here. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, but in all seriousness, I think what needs to enter into that discussion when they look at how they want to spend the funds, uh, Chief Carter talked about uh, target hardening. I think that you absolutely have to look at ways that we can make schools less susceptible to these types of incidents that we were seeing occur far too often. So that has to be part of the discussion. But a couple things beyond that too that I think we need to talk about, uh, training. Training in a couple different areas. Training for your school police departments so that they have an immediate and appropriate response if one of these incidents does occur in one of their schools. That training has to align with whatever major municipality they are linked to, whatever municipal police department that they have. And the training has to be done in conjunction with each other so that when we here in Austin, if we had to provide a response along with AISD, it's not something that we haven't practiced prior, but instead we've worked and we've trained together. Now, I know AISD was not able to be here tonight, but 
a, a, a promising sign for, for us and I think a great sign for our community was that when Chief Ashley Gonzalez, the new chief of AISD, arrived here in Austin, within the first week, he wanted to meet with uh, myself and members of my team to talk about collaboratively keeping our kids safe and the school safe. So it's through training, but it's also training of teachers and it's training of the counselors to be on the lookout for those kids that may need some level of service, some level of help so we can get an early identification. And then the last thing that I would add also that I think should be a part of the discussion um, should be counseling services available in the schools so that when the teachers or the, their peers identify a student who may be having some issues, that there is a resource available to them within the school that can better maybe help them get the help that they need either through that counseling or through private uh, services that they may have uh, something. So again, I think it's target hardening, I think it's training, and then it's the uh, opportunities to have counseling services available for the kids. Okay, I'm going to ask one question that may be kind of hard for both of y'all to answer because it's sort of political. One of the issues with the, the kid who is accused or of the Santa Fe shooting is that he was 16, he used his father's guns, and Governor Abbott has said he wanted to uh, increase the uh, parental responsibility age to 17. However, we have a lot of 18-year-olds in school the flip side of that is, uh, I believe, an 18-year-old in Texas can buy a, uh, a long rifle, which is part of the reason that they have an extended parental responsibility to 18. Should there be some consideration to extending parental responsibility to students who are uh, still in school? I think the one thing that's really important <clears throat> when you talk about parental responsibility, I think there's responsibility across the board. Uh, Parental responsibility, absolutely. I'm in support of anything like that. If you have a young person who is who is not fully developed, or their maturity level is is, a, is not there based on age, the parents need to have a uh, play a strong role in that. I would say, in general, the community has to play a strong role. One of the things Chief Manley talked about here or mentioned that's very important is the importance of information sharing. One of the things that the police need to be able to do their jobs is that when people are in need or they're suffering from some kind of a, a mental illness, there has to be some way for that information to come to the police so that we can uh, address that. For example, the UT Austin, uh, the UTPD has what we call a threat mitigation unit so that when, if, we, if there is any kind of a threat, there may not even rise to the level of a crime we're always going to look at it. I think that's sort of what we're talking about in the information sharing and parental responsibility. So I think, I think that has to be, but I think it has to be for all people. In other words, uh, there needs to be a civic responsibility for, for those, for the young people as well as anybody that, that uh, possesses a firearm. Man. As far as a specific age, you know, I'll leave that up to the legislature to decide what that age should be, 16, 17, or 18, but we need to have responsible gun ownership. Those that are going to choose to own weapons need to make sure that they are maintaining the safety of those weapons, that they're keeping them locked up, and that they are doing everything they can do to prevent access to those weapons, whether it be by the children in their home or by any others that may be in their home. So the, we have laws that already talk about um, the responsibility of locking those up, and I think that that is something that is appropriate. And if the legislature sees the need to raise that age to 17 or 18, then we would respond accordingly. Okay, now you both mentioned hardening the schools, which I think mostly most people think of in terms of uh, metal detectors to get in the schools and in some inner city neighborhoods in other parts of the country they have indeed put in a lot of metal detectors and made it safer but at the same time it kind of creates an atmosphere for the students that they're in a prison so how do you how do you harden the school and still make it feel like an open place for students to go well, I think a lot of that's going to have to deal with the, the actual architecture of trying to design that. And I fully agree that if you have a school that appears to be a prison, then that is not going to be conducive to where we want to go as a society, number one. Are young people growing up in fear? We absolutely don't want that. So there's always a balance. There's always a balance in trying to find what the, what the uh, right public safety measure is versus 
uh, freedom of movement, freedom of thought, all those kinds of things have to be considered in there. I, I do want to come back to one thing that uh, Chief Manley is just uh, also mentioning, is the issue of accountability. You know, we, we want responsible gun ownership. We believe that the uh, collectively, it's not partisan one way or the other, the issue is that there are responsible gun, or, gun owners and, and across the state, across the nation, uh, probably the vast majority are. But we have instances where there are cases where, um, uh, you know, the a gun owner may have been lax in, in taking care of a firearm, especially if there's somebody in the household that's suffering from mental illness or they're a young person or any other kind of things. That also holds true for people that may leave a, a firearm unattended in an unlocked vehicle. That's one of, that's, those are the kind of things that concern the police a lot. We trust our, our fellow citizens that, that are gun owners, but like Chief Manley says, we, we want them to be responsible. There's a civic responsibility in owning a gun. You obviously have a Second Amendment right to own a gun, which controls what the law says and what the government can or can't do uh, to an individual, but there still is a civic responsibility that we all collectively need to be thinking about whether we own a gun or not, is to communicate that. And I, I do think that that's something that the legislature is looking, the governor is looking at to some degree, as those kinds of issues there, accountability systems. Somebody that, that is carelessly, you know, leaves a firearm accessible to a child is, is currently, that could be considered a violation of law. But uh, we've had three instances on UT campus involving where uh, a lawful gun owner had the right to be in a position but left and forgot their firearm in a restroom, restroom in three different instances there. There was not necessarily anything, there was no action necessarily the police could do on that, but what, what I would really stress is the issue of civic responsibility. Had that been in a elementary school, it had been completely different. There would be some level of, of legal accountability that we could possibly apply there, but there was none uh, involving adults. So when we talk about target hardening, Again, because I do think that that's mm -hmm. important. You know, you bring up metal detectors, and I think that's where everybody goes first. They think about the metal detector. And, you know, that is a tool to use that would screen everybody going in. But if you think about it, if you had entrances that had metal detectors, you know, what do we see when we go to the airport or other venues? We see a huge line queued up to go through that. And so it doesn't mean the attack couldn't take place outside of the school in the early hours where kids are queued up. And so that's not always the solution. Mm -hmm. Instead, that could present a different challenge. So I think each school has to look at its own layout and determine how do they best target harden themselves because it's not gonna be a one size fits all solution. I think as new schools are built, they're doing environmental design where they're taking this into account. They're looking at the placement of the windows as far as access visibility from outside. They're looking at the placement of the doors and they're looking at you know, having that inner perimeter that once you come through the main door, you've gotta go through a secondary door. All of this stuff is important, but we also recognize that we've got a lot of investment in the structures that already exist and we've gotta find ways to make those structures work. So target hardening also involves things that you'll do inside the school. When we talk about active shooter uh, training and, and how to respond in the instance, if you found yourself in that, you know, at the department, we have a group of officers that will go out and will train businesses, churches, uh, organizations on how to respond if you found yourself in that situation where there was an active shooter at your place of employment or, or school. And the first tenet is deny, deny them access. And so there are, it's interesting to see the, the devices that have come out, whether it's, uh, there's a, uh, a, a triangular device that I've seen that actually what you would do is you would throw it up top on the hinge thing there so that the door couldn't open. There's ways to put wedges underneath the door, again, to deny that access. And you have to look at, do you still have doors to classrooms that have windows in them, that have visibility into there, or do you wanna block that so that if you, did talk, if you did lock that room down and there was someone roaming the hallways, they couldn't see into that classroom. So these are, some of them are simpler solutions, some some of them are much more involved um, and, and much more costly, but it is something that's important that each school kind of takes an, uh, an evaluation of, of their layout, um, and some of it will be also uh, dictated by the surroundings of the schooling. Is it a school within a neighborhood that is that is somewhat has contained access, excuse me, or is it a school that is more rural and, and has a lot of tree line around it and all that also brings another concern that 
if you have an incident occur in the school and, and all the kids evacuate the school, you've got to make sure that they're evacuating into a safe location. So there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. You mentioned outside the school, and I'll, I'll just remind everybody that one of the first modern uh, so-called assault weapon attacks on a school occurred in Stockton, California, and I think it was uh, uh, 1988 when a, uh, a man who hated Asians went to an elementary school that was primarily populated with Asian children uh, or Asian descent children and opened fire on the playground. Um, and I, I can't remember the exact number he killed, but I think he killed or wounded like about 29 students and teachers. Um, so how do you prepare for uh, the instance where it's not within the school building, where you actually have a mass shooter on the outside? Well, I. I think policing has come a long way since some of these earlier incidents. Because, you know, prior to, um, really prior to Columbine, the, really the, the, the plan was always stage, get your resources. Here in Austin, it would be getting your SWAT team, getting your tactical operations, and then making entry. We realized that that can no longer be the approach to school safety. And the training has gone 180 degrees now in that that first officer knows when he or she arrives that regardless of what they're going to go in and go up against, they have to go in immediately because they may be able to distract, if nothing else, distract the shooter and, and get their attention away from innocent children that cannot protect themselves while they wait for extra officers to arrive. But working in that outdoor environment, it, I mean, it's what police officers do day in and day out around this country when if you've got a, a bank robbery or some type of a violent crime that's occurred and you're chasing that suspect either on foot or, or, or in a vehicle, and, and we would just have to bring in all of the same response elements that we would have. Uh, officers, whether we have canine ability to track them and to try and, and, and bring them into custody that way. Um, if they're, if they're outside, and again, what we've seen in some of these attacks is if they're in a tree line or something, the first is, is trying to you know, locate them. We're fortunate being in a major city here that we have a lot of resources, uh, not only with the officers, but also with equipment, helicopters, FLIR systems, you know, the heat tracking mm -hmm. systems. So it would be bringing everything you had to bear first to locate, isolate, and then to, uh, and then to take them into custody. So, so one of the things that also is the, is the key component there's no single law enforcement agency that can operate in a silo anymore, and that also was something that occurred. One of the things, collaboration across police jurisdictions is really important. Uh, I'm proud to be part of the Austin area because we have a very good uh, working relationship with APD, Travis County Sheriff's, as well as DPS, and all the surrounding uh, areas that all focus on the issue of responding to these kinds of, these kinds of issues and threats coming together will come to bear. So obviously APD will come to support us uh, and, and other entities and DPS and so forth if we need those kind of resources. So that training amongst the law enforcement community and coming together to address those is, is something that, that you see more now than ever before. And perhaps some of that $500 million that was left over can kind of continue to address some of those training needs that, like Chief Manley said, actually at the beginning. Well, Texas has a law that allows um, teachers to be trained to carry weapons at, in the school. How much of a problem is it for a law enforcement officer responding to a school shooting to try and decide whether that teacher is a trained teacher or a shooter? One of the things that happens uh, frequently in discussions about that for every active shooter training is the fact that there are lots of individuals in the state, so whether they're in a, a school setting or in a business setting, there's lots of individuals in the state that actually are licensed to carry. It is our hope, our sincere hope, that the, that the training that they receive also makes it very clear that the police are going to come in. And so most of the training, that I, as I understand it, uh, for those kind of situations there. And I would uh, basically tell people, recognize the fact that the police are going to come, and they're going to come very, very soon. And they're going to come in as a, as a small group or a unit to address whatever that is, and you need to make sure that you're getting down. And I would assume that the concept of school teachers is relatively new, that they're undergoing the same kind of training. 
to your point, it would add another level of complexity to an already uh, confusing situation and, and, uh, and demanding situation. If we look back at some of these events, uh, again, I'll go back to Columbine because that was really a game changer for us. You've got all the smoke alarms and fire alarms going off. You've got lights flashing. You've got all these distractions. You've got gunshots going off, and you've got officers that are going to go in to try and, and bring this to a, to a conclusion. And so it's a very dynamic environment in which you would have to decide if you came across someone that has a weapon, whether they are, in fact, involved in the assault or whether they would be a teacher or a concealed carrier that is, that is, that is trying to resolve the situation themselves. This is training uh, anyone that is a concealed handgun carrier. When they go through that course, that is part of the training, is to recognize that whatever they're involved in, likely the police are responding, as Chief Carter was just saying, and, mm -hmm. and an immediate identification upon seeing that officer to make sure that you are not mistaken for one of the offenders in that situation. Um, those, those situations, um, you know, again, when we, when we hear the after actions and we look at what's going on, they, you can imagine just the overwhelming uh, of your senses that takes place, uh, not only from just what, what you're seeing has played out already, but then again, all the distractions, all the alarms and the sounds and, and the lights and all. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you, the, uh, obviously the, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting, the Santa Fe shooting, those kind of shootings get uh, the most attention, and they also have the the highest number of, of people who were killed or injured. But when you look at the, the list, uh, there was like, uh, I looked at uh, Every Town for Gun Safety before I came over here tonight, and there's been 69 school shootings this year. Um, frankly, most of them are, uh, some of them are adults who have arguments in parking lots or adults who have arguments at a football game a couple of them are actually students who decided to go to school to kill themselves. And they're not the, they're not the dramatic ones that we're talking about. Um, so how do you, how do a police department prepare for the things like the, the gang related shootings in the parking lot or the two angry fans at a football game? I think, uh, I think that uh, <clears throat> goes to police training in general. Uh, you talked about issues whether, uh, and again, we're, we're speaking from sort of a municipal setting and a university setting, as a, so our, our school police chief talking about his philosophy, we're extrapolating a little bit on our training, or at least I am. Uh, I think one of the things, that's something that goes through every, uh, every police academy, goes through every ongoing in-service training to kind of address those kinds of issues. One, one shooting is too many, uh, for quite frankly, but we know that you know, there's a large number of, of uh, both uh, murders and suicides that occur across the country uh, that unfortunately don't rise to the same, get the same level of attention as the, obviously, the very traumatic uh, experience of having somebody come into a school with children and kill many or several of those children. That obviously is an extremely emotional event. I think when you look at it, you have to look at it in perspective also in terms of the context of the numbers. 69 is, is, is just is terrible, if that was the number that you, you that was, quoted. Yep. Uh, that, that's a, a terrible nut, but if you add up the number of fatalities or the injuries in there, it pales in comparison to what happens across the country in terms of the issue of, of murders with both legal and illegal weapons, as well as suicides, which I think is about twice as many. I think suicides. it's about half of all gun deaths are suicides. Yeah, about uh, two to two to one, or something, yeah. something like that. Yeah. So, so those are concerns. So, what you're talking about, what your question was, what happens if there's a, a gang shooting that's occurring in the parking lot? Well, if it's at a school, it's very, very sensitive. The one thing I, that is good is that most schools elementary uh, K through 12 have lockdown procedures. The instant something goes on, the schools uh, are well trained. I know Austin ISD is absolutely in that. They're Austin uh, Independent School District police are engaged in that process of locking down. If there's something going on in the city, as, as Brian, you can attest to, I think there was something fairly recently that turned out to not be a big deal down by Crockett. So there are 
they're used to doing that lockdown procedure. Whether you like that or not, the, the fact is they can do those procedures and the police, whether it's an APD or whoever, can respond and address that. In looking at how do you prevent uh, mm -hmm. those types of, 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 of assaults from occurring, um, the gang assault example that you gave, a lot of that is going to be the work that you've done ahead of time. A lot of that is about the information sharing. It's about being involved in the schools with either the school resource officer and again making sure that as the municipal police department we've got that relationship and that link to the school district police department so that we're aware um, of, of either arguments or disagreements or, or previous violent acts between potential gangs and so we're doing the work on the front end to try and identify when violence may take place between two different groups, either in a school setting or out in the community somewhere else. Um, we've, we've, we do a lot in Austin to try and make those links. Uh, we're in a, a post 9-11 time now when we recognize that there were so many information silos that existed that we just missed so many clues uh, you know, on, on the 9-11 assaults. And law enforcement collectively has done a lot more to share information so that we can identify when something like this may be happening. Here in Austin, we've got the Austin Regional Intelligence Center, which is, for lack of a better term, uh, what, what is commonly known as a, a fusion center, where we bring in all of the local police departments, we share information, and we should hopefully be able to identify a potential violent act if we've got gangs that have for some reason uh, ended up in, in a, uh, a violent encounter with each other so that we can try and prevent that. And then I'll go back to the education part as well, and this is important. The likely sources of information really are going to be the students' peers and, and, and people that are, are close to them. And so that's the information we push out on see something, say something. If there's something going on, let us know. And we have, uh, a lot of times we, we can't talk about what the successes were. We know we've prevented specific things from happening in our community, but we can't always talk about that because that might reveal how we identified it or it might be part of something larger that we're still working on. So um, it, it's important though that we continue to collate, share the data, and, and try and identify those things that might lead to the violent kind of acts that you're talking about. Okay. This, is a little, this question is a little beyond school safety, but when you look at Chicago and the, the high number of, of uh, gun deaths that they've been having in recent years, particularly in the summer months, it's almost always teenagers. Uh, we have uh, Republicans in particular make a big deal out of MS-13, which I believe is a Salvadoran gang, um, which prides itself on killing people. Um, and I don't get the sense that that's as much of a problem here as it is in other parts of the country, but how, how are you looking at the potential for gang violence spreading out of the uh, northern and eastern cities to Texas? I, I'm not sure that we look at it spreading here from the northern and eastern. I think we have to learn from what's, what's happened there. Um, we're fortunate in Austin that we are as safe as we are. We're the fifth safest major city when it comes to violent crime, but we still have violent crime that occurs here. We still have gangs in Austin. We have cartel activity in Austin. We've got I-35 that runs through the city, and we know that the drugs travel north on the highway mm -hmm. and the money travels south. And we know that they are take steps to protect both routes. So we, again, in the early 90s, if you think back, if, if those of you all lived here, what we saw in Austin was the, the crack cocaine uh, movement that really started on the West Coast and was really hitting them in the 80s really made it to Austin in the early 90s. And what we saw as a result of that was we saw the street drug sales on the street corners. And what would that result in is it was a result in uh, turf wars, you know, gang members fighting over the more, the more uh, profitable neighborhoods where they would sell their drugs. And unfortunately, what that resulted in was drive-by shootings as they were trying to protect or take over turf. And if you think about it, it's not something you hear about in Austin that much anymore, drive-by shooting. So we've, we've had some success, but I also think that some of that is, is that they've changed their business practice as well. As, as technology advances and there are other ways to conduct business, it's not out in the streets as it was before. But 
the, the way that you prevent it, again, first of all, you have to identify it. And so we have to be looking for that trend. Uh, one of the things that police departments do today that we didn't do when, you know, Chief Carter and I started 30 years back, uh, a little longer for you. Um, Not that much. But, a little uh, bit. I was his boss at one he was time. My, he was my mentor, actually, as well. We've known each other for quite a while. But, um, <laughs> but um, in, in, uh, sorry, made me lose my train of thought. Um, <laughs> the, um, I've completely derailed. You made me lose my yeah, train of thought. That's where RG comes in. Uh, yeah, so, you, were, uh, you were talking about how when you were young and there were uh, drive-by you. shootings. Thank you. Thank you. No, what I was getting at, no, I, I, no, I really did have a direction here. I always distract him um, like that. So the, um, the, what, what, a lot of, what a lot of progressive law enforcement agencies are doing now is business intelligence. And so we actually use the same products that many of you all may use in your corporations. We use a product called, and I'm not endorsing it, I'm just saying we use it, it's MicroStrategies, and it's a business intelligence tool. But what we use it for is if you think about police departments, we are the repository of a lot of data. We have a lot of information that we hold, that we get, and the calls that we go to, the reports that we take. And if we don't use the analytics behind that and identify the trends and the hotspots and where is crime occurring geographically, where is it occurring temporarily, so that we're, we're in the right places at the right times, then we're not pushing ourselves. So I think all of these things are things that we do to try and stay ahead of the, the challenges we have when we get either gang activity or other types of, of uh, violent crime crews that, that become active in our city. And our systems have become more sophisticated and are evolving all the time. Historically, the police are slow to, on the uptake in terms of technology and so forth, but we're never better than today in terms of embracing micro strategies and, and bringing on some of these concepts into the Austin Regional Intelligence Center, connect the dots and do better than that. We don't want to just put cops on dots. At some point, we want to reach to the predictive model, which is talking about understanding the environment that we're in. And when I say environment, the community that we're in and understanding the pressures that are on there and the pressures that are on you as, as voters as well. One last question before I open it up for questions. Um, I, I'm not gonna try and get you to talk about the politics of campus carry, but other than the firearms left in the bathroom, have you had any problems with campus carry? Um, so a, a lot of people ask me that question uh, in general, and so I was here before and after. One of the things that uh, I, I do have to, to point out is there, like in most situations, the answer is probably not on the extremes. It's probably somewhere in the middle. That's why I said we don't want to get into partisan issues. Everything, the more bipartisan we can come and discuss these issues realistically, the better off we are. Uh, one of the things that I look at is, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, just two years ago, I lost a co-ed on campus due to a murder that occurred prior to campus carry uh, being in effect. A year later, I lost another student to a murder, this case not involving uh, a non-affiliated uh, homeless person, but rather a fellow student after campus carry was into effect. So a lot of people say, are we safer now or are we less safe? Well, the, the issue is, is that uh, for me, personally looking at it, is the law didn't change the, the outcome for me. I suffered, or we, we suffered a murder before and after that. Does that mean that it doesn't, in some cases, does it allows people to defend themselves? Yes, it does. Uh, were we an unsafe location before? Not necessarily, but we did, we did suffer a murder. So I see that law came into effect between two murders, and we hadn't had murder on campus since the, the tower shootings f over 50 years ago. Um, so when I look at the issue, I, I look at it pragmatically, I look at what is the effect. There was a lot of fear and concern when the laws was, were being considered, and a lot of people weighed in, and the law was passed. Time passed, and the issues are for us in terms of issues involving uh, those firearms, like we mentioned, there were three cases involving uh, somebody that was in a lawful place on campus with, that was also licensed to carry who had 
accidentally left their firearm out, and, and that is actually was the biggest concern for us. There might have been one or two instances where a license to carry person uh, unintentionally exposed their firearm under, the, um, under st state law today. If you're not on the university campus like UT, you can technically, you can open carry, as everybody knows that, and that causes a lot of people's concern. I always ask people, look, how often do you see it? You see it sometimes. You're more likely to see it in the more rural areas than you are in, in the city. But the issue is for us is that um, if you're on campus and you're licensed to carry, you can't open carry, so it can't be exposed. So we have responded to a couple of cases like that, but the law is very clear. It says that they have to intentionally have done that. If it was an unintentional exposure, it's not a violation of the law. The ones that, that do worry me really are the issue about, uh, you know, people need to be responsible. We need to be civic-minded, responsible gun owners. Uh, Brian and I are both gun owners, and hopefully we're civic-minded and responsible. Uh, but those are the kind of things that we want to kind of stress here. Those are the kind of issues that we've seen on campus. Not a lot, but just in three instances. And, and it, was, it was kind of a strange uh, uh, coincidence that they all three occurred within about a two-week period, nothing before or after uh, that time. But nothing happened. Uh, somebody sp spotted the gun laying in a restroom stall or something like that and, and, and did the right thing and called us and we responded to it. And obviously, we looked into the circumstances of that and uh, we will always do that. But in terms of, um, uh, you know, people always want to know how many people are caring. I can't answer that. Can't answer that by law. Uh, I would tell you, you can kind of extrapolate. There's not probably as many as you think, but there are maybe more than some people think. There are places still that the president has the right to say and the authority to say that you can't go in certain places, and then, of course, that comes up from time to time. Um, we do have to answer to the legislature on all of our uh, instances if involving a, a firearm and report to them, um, and we report to them so the legislation uh, legislative session is coming up, so who knows what will, will come up. Okay. Uh, questions from the audience? Uh, I see. We're going to, I think she's going to bring microphones around. Yeah, Chief Manley, I just wanted to ask you could you discuss the effort? This isn't necessarily related to school violence, but the special policing effort that you all have done with the LBJ school up in Northeast Austin. Do you know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about? Which, uh, I'm not familiar it's with. It's the one, like, uh, the Center for Health and Social Policies at the LBJ School has been working with uh, some of your officers to do a special community targeted effort in a high crime area in Northeast Austin. It sounds like it's similar to what we do in other high crime areas where, again, we go in and we deploy additional resources based on what the threat is. I, I, I'm not sure about the specifics on the LBJ project that you're talking about, if it's similar to ones we've done in other neighborhoods where it's just overridden with, with crime issues that are much more, uh, uh, I guess, frequent than the, the, uh, the population for that neighborhood would be, um, we, would, we would add the additional resources, but it would be in partnership with either, if it's at the school, with the school police, but also based on the data that we're gathering through the, the, uh, the analytics on what's happening there. And, and maybe we should talk offline so I can give you probably a better response if I can better understand the, the program. And we have another question right here. Whoops, back to the front. So I'm somewhat naive about this particular subject. Um, it occurs to me that police officers must have uh, in-service training from time to time on, with their firearms. But if um, concealed carry teachers are in the classroom, do they have any continual in-service training with their firearms? And my concern would be, of course, if you're not practicing your fire with your firearm, you are more likely to shoot a student than to shoot the shooter. I, I don't know the answer to that because the, the you're talking to the school district. Uh, school districts can allow, I think that's what you're you're talking about, teachers that are, are, are 
Carrie, to my knowledge, that doesn't exist in, yeah. in Austin, but it does in rural areas, but I don't know what the requirements are for them. As far as whether a C, I think what you're asking, does a CHL holder have a requirement like to qualify every year with their weapon? And unfortunately, I'm licensed through the state to have a weapon. I've never obtained a CHL. I know what they have to have to obtain the initial license, but your point is very valid in that even when you get that license and you go through that training, you're going through training in a very safe environment and you're firing at a paper target. And we know in law enforcement with our officers that we train regularly and, and uh, we, we know how we perform in those stressful situations when officers are placed in a position to have to fire their weapons. And the accuracy that you will see in a real scenario versus the accuracy we test and we see on the range when we practice is very different. So yes, that is a, a valid concern about the use of the weapon under stressful situations by someone who is not regularly practicing. And if we think about the setting in which you're talking about a classroom, it's gonna be a very populated place most likely. And so uh, it's, uh, it's something that has to be considered um, and, and someone has to also make sure that they have the ability to use that weapon if the situation presented itself like that. I'll just throw out, I know a little bit about this. Uh, the, uh, what, what's the state agency that licenses law enforcement officers? Uh, TCOL, Texas yeah. Commission on Law Enforcement. The, all the teachers who get these uh, uh, licenses are trained by this state agency, and I believe they have to have 80 hours of training and compare that to a CHL holder who only has to have eight hours of training. Um, now the question is, well, that I can't answer it, is do they have continuing education? So, uh, but they are, they are licensed at a little bit higher level and so it's not something that every teacher is just gonna suddenly be packing heat at school. <laughs> we got a couple of questions toward the back back there. Keep your hands up, she's coming. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lisa Ross. Um, I have a question for Chief Carter. Um, I wanted to ask you about, I know that you do a lot with orientation uh, for young students when they first come in there with their parents and stuff like that. So I wanted to ask about uh, safe storage. Do you, I know you talk about sexual harassment when you're on cal college campuses and you talk about drinking with students and that and with parents as well. Do you also um, talk and address the the uh, need for safe storage if they're going to be bringing a firearm onto the campus? The, the university has actual rules uh, that are stipulated under, um, you can find them on the website that talk specifically about what the requirements are. Actually, if you know the truth, you can't store a firearm on campus other than under certain circumstances in like uh, married student housing apartments. And even there, that has to be within uh, uh, a certain framework in terms of locked up. Uh, but generally speaking, a, a student, a freshman student coming in that would be receiving orientation is not going to get information on how to store a weapon because number one is the vast majority of our students are not, uh, not old enough to actually have a license to carry a yeah, permit, the I actual license. I understand that, that you have to be 21 years or older. I do understand that. But I know that a lot of the students on off campus that live off the campus can actually have firearms. That's and correct. I just wondered in the orientation, when you do your orientation discussions, when you're talking about drinking and you're talking about sexual harassment with these parents, do you also discuss the importance that if they're going to live off campus or they're going to visit another student off campus, that their guns are stored properly and this is what the storage looks like and do you have like a, maybe a model program if you have a friend that is possibly feeling suicidal, let, these are some tools that you can use and resources. Do you go over that in orientation and do you have an educational program towards that? So one of the things that everybody does in the university setting in terms of orientation is you're competing for time. You're also looking at, generally speaking, on the areas, focusing on the areas on campus especially the campus housing. There are obviously there are issues. The student is living in the city. There are other kinds of uh, components. Just recently, uh, there was a, on a national night out, um, 
and I'm sorry, I can't remember. I can't see you, but it wasn't you, I don't think, Lisa. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> okay, I, I, okay. I see your, your question sounds familiar. And so your, 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 your program has great value, but, but it is, it's not a university program. And it's, so it's an, it's it's an off-campus related issue. And I think Chief Reyes was, was pushing that yeah. as well. He's the, he's the uh, works for, for Brian and the what, North District. He's, the, he's my North Patrol Chief. Yeah, North Patrol. But thank you for bringing that up, Lisa. But that's one of the things. Can see something where we can work together as a community to really bring the awareness of how important it is for these college students, whether they're off-campus, whether they're starting their guns properly. And it's not only about the housing, but in their cars as well, so that they don't get stolen, like you were saying earlier today. Those are good, good, good points. Hi, thank you both for being here. I'm an LBJ student, um, and I'm studying gun violence as kind of my focus. So I had like two main takeaways from today. Um, one concern is that narrowing this issue to a school shooting context kind of, in a way, ignores the larger problem of gun violence, I think. Um, and the second is that uh, dedicating money towards like infrastructure and whatnot, I feel like doesn't, it's a reactionary solution. It doesn't um, target the problem of dangerous people having guns. Um, I know you said that you all do not uh, do advocacy. However, I do know that in the past, uh, law enforcement has, or I don't know what entity of uh, law enforcement, but they have gone to the legislature and uh, argued um, on behalf of public safety. And so I'm wondering what you all can do to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people in particular? Well, I think we do. I, I, I think we, maybe it wasn't stated correctly at the beginning. We do actually um, take positions on legislative issues. Uh, SB4 was a big issue in this community. I testified at the legislature against that bill. And, and I think you're right. If we, we were focused today on schools because that was, that was kind of the topic of discussion. But there are things that are out there being discussed. So Austin being the 11th largest city in the country, we are part of the Major City Chiefs Association. And this is an association of the largest, I think we have 76 members right now, the 76 largest police departments across the country. And we put out position papers that we send to states and to national um, representatives, our congressmen, our senators, and all of that when these issues are being debated. And we've taken a position on several of these issues, like uh, red flag warnings, uh, the ability to uh, have family members or others identify someone who may be in a mental health crisis and either take weapons that they possess or keep them from gaining weapons, on having stronger laws on who should even have access to a weapon in the first place. There are restrictions for those that have been convicted of crimes, but can we expand that for those that may be suffering from some immediate mental health issues? So there are things that we take absolute positions on, bump stocks, the, the, the need for bump stocks after what we learned uh, from Las Vegas just over a year ago. So we do absolutely take positions on issues, and it may be that it's a position that I or Chief Carter takes locally, although you, you're kind of restricted being a state uh, representative, but through the larger organization of Major City Chiefs Association, we put out position papers and we have regular meetings. Uh, we actually just had a meeting in Orlando a week ago, and the president actually came and addressed the, the membership of the meeting. So, uh, so we do take positions. And, and, I, and I'll, I'll echo also, I think one of the things, we might have got a little bit confused here, so is the, the focus on school safety. We kind of looked at it as K through 12, and specifically where we're going here. So we didn't go into the broader aspects, to, but one of the things that law enforcement and police chiefs uh, around the country, obviously, as, as, as Chief Manley just su suggested, uh, want to give constructive advice, not give uh, information that's necessarily going to uh, fuel one side or the other, but what can we do collectively in a bipartisan way? That's the way I see it. I also really stress that one of the things that, that recently came up that I think has uh, has uh, great potential and something I'd love to see is the issue of the red flag uh, issue and the governor did in fact bring that up. I know that's still kind of sorted in itself. I think he backed off from that. But well, it's still the point is he, yeah. he brought it up and there's real value there because one of the things that we've got to do as a society and as police serving each of you regardless of your position 
We serve our entire community, what, regardless of what position a person has on a political issue. That's not where I come from. I believe the police have to serve our community using the laws that you collectively pass. But there are tools that you can do to help uh, work with your police department in terms of sharing information, the red flag issue, I think civic responsibility. You have, a, you, you have constitutional rights that protect you from the government from doing certain things, but there's that civic responsibility, which to me is it's not the law. It's about us collectively as, as a community, not you know, one side or the right or the left of the issue, but coming together and looking at things practically to try and address that where there are things that we can, we can get around and work, work to address. And so I support the issue of the red flag laws that are going on around the country because, listen, if there's somebody there, and I don't think there's any responsible gun owner that wants somebody that's in a in mental distress or a criminal to have a firearm that they can hurt somebody else. And they need to be able to work with us. And we need to be able to work with our, uh, each other, whether it's federal, state, or local. I'm gonna just highlight one thing I think that's happening really good in the state, is that we talked a little bit about technology. We also talked about the issue of the police coming together. You look at the Houston area in terms of the uh, the technology they're using to match shell casings and getting police departments to share information across across uh, jurisdictions and across municipal and state and and federal uh, coming together to identify actual real criminals uh, in terms of murderers that are using handguns. But the red flag for us, so we we think that technology is going to play a role. Strong law enforcement there. We also think it's important for the community to recognize that civic responsibility in terms of if you do have a gun, to make sure that it is secure, right? like Lisa talks about. Those are important. Make sure that if you have a, you have a family member who is in distress or uh, uh, prone to some kind of violence that you, you work to, to remove that firearm with them and hopefully the police and the government can come in in the right way and address that issue. I think that's really important. So there is a lot of discussion in the law enforcement community, but we want to do it in a way that serves the entire community. And if you can, real quick, just as a part of your research, since this is an area that you are putting a lot of work towards, I would encourage you, go to the Major City Chiefs Association, go to our, go to our website, and if you go under news articles, you would think it would be under position papers, but it's not. If you go under news articles, you will find the position paper that we issued in May of this very year, and it highlights all of the issues that we have taken a stance on, and this is something that will inform your research, and it is something that we have pushed to our uh, policymakers, both uh, at state and federal levels. I think we have time for one more question. So. Hi. Um, I wanted to first clarify something earlier. Uh, the school marshal program is the, the mechanism by which people can go through that 80-hour training and then carry a gun in a classroom. But there is also a way for people who have not gone through the school marshal program to carry in schools with as little as four hours of training that, that you get. Your, your LTC is actually only four hours as the minimum. Um, so I think people need to be really aware of that distinction, that there is something that's a so-called guardian program um, that does allow people with ex just a tiny amount of training to carry guns in schools. And so that's something that as citizens we need to be aware of and as parents. Um, but I wanted to ask, kind of similar to what Lisa was saying, uh, uh, Chief Carter mentioned that we need to be civic-minded and responsible with firearms. And so I really want to thank um, Chief Manley. I know that APD has worked with um, safe storage campaigns and, and giving out gun locks, and I really appreciate that. And as, as a mom, you know, bringing my kids on campus, for example, for your, um, that UT day that they do every year, I'd be worried about them going to the bathroom and <laughs> finding a gun. I didn't know it happened three times. I thought it was two times. So given that, it makes me feel like there is a place perhaps somewhere to do that education of, hey, to be civic-minded and responsible, this is what you need to do to store your firearms safely. But my question, my long-winded way to get to my question is, those three instances, I heard about those today, two and then one today. I have two nephews that go to A&M, and I learned from them that um, not only was there a situation where someone fired a weapon accidentally, and the bullet went through into another room, and thank God nobody was hurt, 
But, and that made news. What they told me that didn't make news was apparently there was this skirmish over some senior boots, which are a big deal to those Aggies. And um, the student whose boots were taken apparently pulled out his gun um, to try to settle the matter. Is there, do you all talk to each other, you police chiefs, at these, all these schools? There was another shooting on, on another A&M system campus. Someone shot himself in the leg in his car on campus. Uh, this is after campus carry. So there's been these incidents, but we may not know about all of them. Is there a way that you're all reporting or talking to one another to see, is campus carry causing a problem? Um, so I apologize for the long-windedness, but that's my question. Um, well, yeah, you put a lot in there. So I, I'm actually not, <laughs> I, I'm not actually familiar with the, the shootings at A&M. That's my alma mater, right? So I'm not, I'm not actually familiar with those. Uh, Any time there is an, uh, an incident, um, such as if there's an actual shooting, more than likely there's an actual crime that's being reported that would be actually goes into uh, actual what's required. The school has a, a duty to report under Clary, as well as also the unified crime reporting under the FBI as a crime. So we do it both, both ways. So there is sort of a communication when we look at universities across the nation, because that's what happens whenever there's a, re a report comes out. Everybody always wants to compare and see what their issues are, just the same way as the major city chiefs. They want to see what the issues are in their particular communities. We look at it, but most importantly for me is that one, one shooting would be far too many. Uh, and obviously we want to address those, and if there are ways to, to address that, especially uh, with communities that have you know, issues like, uh, or suggestions on storage or safe storage and all those kind of things. But the police are not, we're not an island to ourselves. We are your public servants and we're, our job is to serve you with and through you. So engage us on those concepts and, and um, that dialogue. I'm, I'm certainly open to that moving forward. I don't think I answered your question, though. Okay. But. Well, I tell you what, she can grab you afterwards. Uh, Chief Carter, Chief Manley, I appreciate you being here, and everybody give them a hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.